Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a gorgeous summer evening at York and at the York Festival of Ideas. Uh, my name is Tom McLeish. I'm a professor of in the physics department at York, but my role as professor of natural philosophy um, tells me that part of my job is to explore connections between the sciences and the humanities, the arts and the social sciences, um, and in fact, everything that makes us human. And that's the same theme that lies behind this first event in a series of festival focus of four, which we've called Science Imagination and the Big Questions. There's going to be science and poetry. There's going to be narrative of conflicts and why they're good or bad. And uh, we're going to even touch on the, the spiritual side of the scientific imagination at the end, before the end of the festival, more of that later. But I can't think of a better way of beginning this series than to welcome our guest this evening. Avi Loeb is um, our first guest and main speaker is uh, Frank Bedge, Junior Professor of Science at Harvard University. He is has also been the longest running uh, head of the Harvard Astronomy Department. Um, and uh, we are very fortunate to have him for a number of reasons this evening, not the least of which is that Avi just told me that in the last five months, um, he has received, uh, engaged with 700 media interviews, plus presentations like this one. Um, now, why would that be? Uh, yeah, he's a well-known Harvard professor of astronomy, um, but uh, those of us who are professors don't normally get that much media attention. Um, it could be because he and his colleagues worked out a really neat way of identifying that the black hole in the center of our Milky Way galaxy a few years ago was actually black without imaging it, or that more recently he's been engaged in the Harvard Black Hole Project and um, linked to the uh, Event Horizon Telescope, which has imaged the black uh, a black hole, not in our galaxy. But what actually happened was uh, that in um, 2017, um, the Pan-STARRS uh, Sky Survey spotted uh, an asteroid, um, asteroid which became um, named Oumuamua, um, which had a rather odd shape um, and a rather odd trajectory. And Abby suggested that we just might, might consider that it might have been from an alien civilization. But, uh, and that woke up all sorts of ideas. So with no, with no further ado, I can't wait to hear the story behind that. Um, so I'm gonna hand over right now to Abby. Abby, thank you so much for joining us at the York Festival of Ideas. Oh, I forgot one thing. I'm supposed to say one other thing. Um, uh, which is that there's a Q&A, everyone who wants to join in the discussion, which we'll have, Avi, we'll have Amanda Reese. I'll tell you about her later, she's going to respond, and then we'll have a discussion. Please be putting your questions and answers, uh, questions, we'll give the answers, and you can, uh, in the Q&A, down there on the screen, uh, store them up during the evening, and so we've got plenty to get going uh, with by the end. And technical issues such as loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin if you drop out, and um, by all means ask technical questions too. Sorry, I forgot that. Over to Avi. Avi, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Tom. It's a great pleasure uh, to be virtually visiting you. I would much rather be in person. Um, and what I'll discuss in the next 30 minutes uh, is uh, primarily my book uh, uh, titled Extraterrestrial that you can see in the middle of this slide. Uh, I just shared my screen and I hope everyone can see it. Uh, and if I had to summarize this book, I would say, uh, when you are not ready to find exceptional things, you will never discover them. That was the subject of a Scientific American essay that I published uh, last year. There is another book, a textbook of more than a thousand pages that will be uh, published in two weeks by Harvard University Press. You see it on the right side of this slide. It's called Life in the Cosmos that I wrote with my former postdoc, Manas V. Lingam. And it addresses the scientific background for in the search for life, uh, which I very much hope will become mainstream uh, in astronomy. And what you see on the left side of this slide uh, is a photograph of a picture that was hung on the walls of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of uh, Science and the Humanities uh, in October 2020. Uh, it was 
The photograph was taken by the German photographer Herlinda Quilbel, who came to my office uh, at Harvard and asked me to write on the palm of my hand the question that I regard as the most important uh, in science. And uh, I wrote, are we alone? Um, so uh, the fundamental uh, perspective that I currently have uh, was shaped by decades of studying the sky, the universe, and it's a perspective of modesty. And uh, to illustrate why most recently I developed this perspective, uh, let me read two paragraphs from my book that relate to the fact that both my parents passed away over the past few years. My father, David, was laid to rest in the same red soil in which he planted trees all his life, in the vicinity of those plantations that he watered routinely, near the house that he built with his rugged hands and that I grew up in, surrounded by the people he loved and who loved him in return, under the blue sky that they study as an astronomer. My mother, Sarah, who put me on the road to thinking as a philosopher with whom I spoke daily throughout my adulthood and who especially gifted me with a life of the mind was buried beside him two years later. In astronomy, we realize that matter takes new forms over time. The matter we are made of was produced in the hearts of massive stars that exploded. It assembled to make the earth that nourishes plants that feed our bodies. What are we then, if not just fleeting shapes taken by a few specks of material for a brief moment in cosmic history on the surface of one planet out of so many? We are insignificant, not just because the cosmos is so vast, but also because we ourselves are so tiny. Each of us is merely a transient structure that comes and goes, recorded in the minds of other transient structures. And that is all. And so this sense of cosmic modesty is amplified by the astronomical fact that we now know that about half of all the sun-like stars host an Earth-sized planet roughly at the same separation as the Earth is from the sun. So altogether, there are more habitable Earths in the observable volume of the universe than grains of sand on all beaches on Earth. And that brings me to the idea of cosmic modesty. We are not privileged. What we find in our backyard is very common. Not only that we are not at the center of the world, the center of the universe, but we are pretty typical in our environment. And therefore, it makes very little sense to be arrogant, just like the king or emperor that is shown in this picture, uh, who was very proud of himself after in conquering a piece of land here on earth, uh, but is no different than an ant hugging a single grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. That's not very impressive. But I can understand where it's coming from. Uh, when my daughters were young and they were at home, they tended to think that the world centers on them and that they are the smartest. And they had a psychological shock when we took them to the kindergarten. Uh, they suddenly saw that there are other kids out there that may be smarter than they are. And so our civilization would mature only when we find others. And we are probably not the sharpest cookies in the jar. And by the jar, I mean the Milky Way galaxy. And the reason I say that is as a result of reading the news on a daily basis. We are fighting each other. We are investing a lot of our resources in trying to feel superior relative to other people. That makes very little sense in the big scheme of thing, things. And my definition of an intelligent species is a species that shares the guiding principles of science, collaborating and sharing evidence-based knowledge. That's the underlying principle of science, cooperating and sharing evidence-based knowledge. How frequently do you see that in the news? 
even when the pandemic started, uh, scientists were not allowed to visit Wuhan, China, where it started. That would have saved a lot of lives. And actually, in my book, I talk about Winston Churchill that in 1939 defined the search for extraterrestrial life as one of the most exciting frontiers in an essay that he wrote, but he could never, never had a chance to publish it because he was drafted to be the prime minister of the UK to fight the Nazi regime. And, and the Second World War basically wasted $4 trillion for the US economy alone and killed 75 million people, 3% of the world population. Two thirds of the Jewish community in Europe was killed during that war, six million. And just think about these resources, if instead of wasted on the war, they would have been dedicated to pursue Churchill's vision and search for life. We would have known the answer by now. Earth is our home, but only for a while. So uh, there are all kinds of threats. Um, there are internal threats from climate change, from non-conventional wars, pandemics, and so forth. There are external threats from asteroid impact and so forth. You know, the dinosaurs 66 million years ago were very arrogant. They thought highly of themselves until a rock the size of Manhattan Island showed up. And when it hit the ground, their uh, ego trip uh, was tarnished uh, abruptly. Um, so let me say a few words about myself um, and uh, how I got into space exploration, the, the idea that we might want to spread our eggs in more than one basket. Right now, everything that is precious to us is here on Earth. Uh, I was born 59 years ago. You can see me at age seven in the top left. Uh, I was born on a farm and I used to collect eggs every afternoon. So you can see in the second image, I used to drive the tractor to the hills of the village uh, and read philosophy books. Uh, that fascinated me because philosophy addresses the most fundamental questions we have. Uh, and I'll skip some steps and mention that uh, in 2015, a black limousine parked in front of the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard, and out of it came uh, an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley named Yuri Milner. He came to my office sat on the sofa and asked me whether I'm willing to lead a project to visit the nearest star within his lifetime. And since he, he is as old as I am, I realized it has to be done within a couple of decades. But the nearest star is four light years away. So that means you need to send a spacecraft at a fifth of the speed of light in order for it to get there in two decades. And that's a thousand times faster than chemical rockets, the type of spacecraft that we launched so far. So I told him I need to think about it. And then we came up with the idea and announced it in April 2016 in the company of Stephen Hawking and Freeman Dyson, as you can see in the bottom middle uh, photo. This is a, a picture of the solar system. You see the sun on the left. And actually, uh, most of the volume of the solar system is occupied by the so-called Oort cloud, which contains all the bricks that were left over from the construction project of the planets in the solar system. Um, these are rocks that are floating out there. And when they, every now and then, when one of them comes close to the sun, since they have ice on their surface, they appear as comets, uh, they evaporate. And the Oort cloud goes roughly halfway to the nearest star, it extends out to about 100,000 times the Earth-Sun separation. The nearest star is uh, in the Alpha Centauri system, it's Proxima Centauri. And here is an artist's illustration of Proxima Centauri. It happens to be a dwarf star, 12% of the mass of the Sun, uh, half the surface temperature of the Sun, so it emits mostly infrared light. And it turns out that there is a planet in the habitable zone around it, where liquid water may exist on the surface of that planet, roughly the size of the Earth. And uh, this planet is most likely tidally locked. It has a permanent day side and a permanent night side. And my daughters say that if we ever go there, they want to live on the strip that separates these two sides. Because if you go to the porch, you can see the sunset forever. Just imagine that, that the sun never sets. 
Um, since the star emits mostly infrared radiation, you might ask, is there, uh, could there be animals with infrared eyes? Uh, and I asked uh, my students at class uh, a couple of months ago, and one of them found the creature on Earth that has sensitivity to infrared, and that's a shrimp that you can see in the picture that I just posted. And um, it has uh, two eyes that look like um, ping pong balls attached uh, with cords to the head of the shrimp. And it does look like an alien to me. Now, how do we get there? The method that I recommended to uh, Yuri Milner was uh, using uh, the concept of a light sail, basically a thin film of material that is strong, uh, which is being pushed by reflecting light, a very powerful laser beam. And you can attach electronics to that uh, sail. Uh, and this project is called Starshot. And here you can see the video that describes the concept. Uh, the sail is released above the atmosphere, so it doesn't encounter the friction. Uh, and then uh, a, a very powerful laser beam is produced by a an array of low power lasers. And it has needs to have about 100 gigawatts in total, shining on a sail roughly the size of a person that weighs about a gram. And that will bring it within a few minutes to a fifth of the speed of light across a distance that is five times the distance to the moon. So the launch is a few minutes. And then after that, the journey is 20 years. That's why what you see in science fiction doesn't really make much sense. No human would embark uh, a spaceship that takes a, a huge amount of time to reach the nearest stars. Anyway, when this spacecraft reaches uh, Proxima Centauri, it could pass near the planet, take a photograph, and send it back to Earth. And then the signal, of course, would be very weak by the time it reaches Earth. And one of the challenges is to detect it. So this is called the Starshot Project. And for me, the fundamental question is not so much whether we are alone or not, but are we the smartest kid on the block? And looking at recipe books, I'm impressed by the fact that out of the same ingredients, you can get very different cakes. So what's the chance that we represent the best cake possible out of the chemicals that existed on Earth early on? Very small. So out of modesty, I would say there might be more intelligent species that existed in the past or exist right now out there. But without prejudice, let's just check and see if we find any evidence for them. A lot of people have opinions. Um, and in 2017, the PANSTARS uh, telescope, as Tom mentioned, uh, in Hawaii, uh, discovered the first object that uh, came from outside the solar system that visited our vicinity uh, that we found. And that was given the name Oumuamua, which means a scout in the Hawaiian language. You can see it here circled in blue. And it actually came from a very special frame of reference uh, in the sky. It came from the direction towards which the sun is moving um, in the local frame of the galaxy. So you can get to the so-called local standard of rest when you average the motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. And obviously the sun is moving relative to that frame, uh, but Oumuamua was at rest in the local standard of rest. Only one in 500 stars is so much at rest. So it, it, it was very peculiar in that sense. And it was kicked by the sun, just like a buoy sitting on the surface of the ocean that uh, is given a kick by a ship uh, passing near it. And as it was tumbling, when it passed close to the sun, uh, this object reflected light from the sun and the amount of light that it reflected changed by a factor of 10 every eight hours as it was tumbling. And that implied that it has a very extreme shape, most likely pancake shape, a flat object, which again is a very unusual fact, very weird. And there was no cometary tail, no gas, no dust around it. Visually, we, can, we could say that, but 
actually the Spitzer Space Telescope looked very deeply and couldn't find any traces of carbon-based molecules around it. So it was definitely not a comet of the type that we have seen before. And in addition to those properties, uh, it also showed a very unusual fact that um, it was pushed away from the sun by some force uh, that could not have been as a result of the rocket effect of evaporation of gases because we didn't see any gas around it. And about 10% of the mass of it needed to evaporate in order to give it the push that, that we saw. And so what, what's the origin of this push? The only possible origin, likely origin that I could think of is the reflection of sunlight. And for that to be effective, the object had to be very thin, sort of like a sail, a light sail. But nature doesn't make light sails. So then maybe it's artificial. And we had that sentence in a scientific paper that uh, was accepted for publication within a few days in the Astrophysical Journal. And I didn't anticipate uh, a lot of reaction to that, but there was a lot of pushback from the scientific community and a lot of attention from the public. Since then, there were four proposals for a natural origin of Oumuamua. And all of them contemplated something that we've never seen before. So that I rest my case. If it's something that we've never seen before, we should entertain the possibility that it's artificial. What were the possibilities? One was maybe it's a dust bunny, just like you find at home, except the size of a football field. So you need an object that is porous, that is 100 times less dense than air, very lightweight, like a feather being pushed by reflecting sunlight. The only problem is that when you put such a cloud of dust particles on a trajectory that gets close to the sun, it will be heated by hundreds of degrees and will not maintain its integrity, doesn't have the material strength. Another suggestion was maybe it's a shrapnel, a small piece of material torn apart by tidal force when the, and a bigger object passed close to a star. The problem with that is you often get uh, elongated pieces, cigar shaped, and this object was most likely pancake shaped. Uh, there was a suggestion maybe it's a hydrogen iceberg, uh, and then we don't see the evaporation because hydrogen is transparent. And the problem with that is, first, we've never seen a hydrogen iceberg in space, and second, such an object would evaporate very quickly by absorbing starlight, and it wouldn't survive the journey through interstellar space. There was also the suggestion, maybe it's a nitrogen iceberg. Again, never seen before in the solar system. Here, the idea was it was chipped off the surface of a Pluto-like planet around another star. The problem here is the mass budget. You just need more heavy elements than you find in all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy to produce enough chips such that we will see one of them as Oumuamua. So it doesn't quite work out. And uh, this is from a review of an early review of my book. I didn't quite understand a couple of words here, but my daughters explained them to me. And so my interpretation of Oumuamua is that, you know, it's just like walking on the beach. Most of the time you see natural rocks uh, like or seashells that were naturally produced. But every now and then you encounter a plastic bottle. And that gives you an important message that there is a civilization out there. There was another object discovered that uh, showed excess push by reflecting sunlight and no cometary tail. It was discovered by the same telescope, PanStars, and was given the name 2020 SO. It was found in September 2020, last year. And as the astronomers immediately recognized that this object was actually a rocket booster that was launched from Earth in 1966 as part of a lunar lander mission. So this rocket booster had thin walls, and that's why it exhibited a push by reflecting sunlight. It had a lot of area for its mass. So we know that we produced it artificially. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? There was a second interstellar object that looked just like a comet. 
So I was asked, well, if the second one looks like a comet, doesn't it convince you that Oumuamua is natural? And my reply was, when you find a plastic bottle on the beach, and after that you find a lot of rocks, it doesn't make the plastic bottle a rock. So the fundamental question is, was Oumuamua natural in origin or artificial? And one can easily answer this. It's not a philosophical question. You just need a high-resolution photograph. That's all. Because they say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book. If we had a photograph of Oumuamua, I wouldn't need to write the book. And we do have a photograph, you can see it here, of an asteroid called Bennu. It was obtained by the OSIRIS-REx mission. And in fact, that mission actually landed on Bennu and took a sample that it will bring back to Earth in 2023. So just imagine landing on an artificial object. I mean, we can easily tell the difference between a rock and an artificial object, a piece of equipment. And just imagine landing on a piece of equipment, reading off the label, made on planet X. And moreover, bringing the technology that may be in our future to Earth. It could be worth a lot of money. I'll just skip a few slides um, and, and point out that, you know, this is the, a, a brief illustration of the history of the universe, starting from the Big Bang on the left. We just came to exist recently as a technological civilization only over the past century or so. Before that, we were not that interesting. That may explain why nobody cared about us and came to visit us. Um, but most of the stars formed billions of years before the sun. And so if they ended up making technological civilizations around them, uh, then those predated us. And they may have sent equipment into space that we can search for. Just like we are sending Voyager 1, Voyager 2, New Horizons, and more spacecraft in the future. And of course, you can look for other technological relics, other technological signatures, not just the objects floating in space. Um, you can look for industrial pollution in the atmospheres of planets. And I wrote a paper about that uh, six years ago. You can look for artificial lights on the night side of Proxima B. That's a paper that I wrote two weeks ago and posted it with this, an undergraduate student from Stanford. You can look for reflectance of photovoltaic cells that cover the day side of a planet. You can look for beams of light sweeping through our sky and they would appear as a flash of light. There are lots of technological signatures that one can look for. And Speaking about a beam of light that can, may push a, a light cell, a light cell could be pushed to the speed of light, not necessarily by a laser, but also by an exploding star. If you park light sails around an exploding star, just like surfers on the beaches of Hawaii are waiting for a giant wave to carry them. You know, these sails could wait for the explosion of the star that will produce a flash of light that will carry them up to the speed of light. They would behave just like dandelion seeds. You can see those on the right side here uh, that are carried by the wind. So Enrico Fermi, a very famous physicist, asked about 70 years ago, where is everybody? If there are technological civilizations out there, out there, why don't we see them? Well, that's a very presumptuous question. You know, when I met my wife, she had a lot of friends that uh, used to wait for Prince Charming on a white horse to come over and make them a marriage proposal. And it never happened. So they compromised. And my point is, it's not at all obvious that we as a civilization uh, we were so interesting that someone would come over and have a party in our backyard. We only developed technologies that are of interest, perhaps, um, a century ago. And as I mentioned before, we do not behave 
as a particularly intelligent species. But moreover, it may well be that there is a very narrow window uh, uh, of opportunity for us to communicate with another civilization because that is just like um, if you are searching for radio signals, for example, it's just like trying to have a phone conversation. You need the counterpart to be alive. And maybe technological civilizations like ours only survive for a few centuries. Look at world politics. It's not clear that we would survive more than a few centuries from now, given what we do to the climate. So if that's the case, it makes much more sense to engage in space archaeology, looking for relics of civilizations that are dead by now. We don't need them to be alive when we are searching for them. We can just look for the equipment that they sent into space. And my hope is that by finding relics of civilizations who perished by now as a result of misbehaving, that would teach us a history lesson. It would inspire us to get our act together and avoid a similar fate. Thank you. Ravi, thank you so much for uh, that well, beautiful talk, fascinating, challenging, um, extraterrestrial, and visually, visually very beautiful. We've all enjoyed that. Um, I'm going to invite a colleague of mine up onto the virtual stage now. Dr. Amanda Rees is um, a uh, historian of science and a sociologist in our Department of Sociology at the, Department of, at the University of York. Um, she works particularly on the history of field sciences, narratives of science and religion, relationship between humans, um, other animals, and the history of the future. And I get all my science fiction top recommendations from my colleague, Dr. Reese, I should say. Not that tonight has been necessarily about science fiction. Um, she's uh, currently also very fortunate to have Amanda with us uh, as well, because Dr. Reese is, is the, uh, currently the uh, editor of the British, the British Journal of the History of, of Science. My last um, edition just arrived this week, as well as co-editor of the History of the Human Science. This is at her most recent book with Charlotte Slee is called Human, more of that anon. Um, Dr. Reese, I'm going to invite you, Mandy, to uh, respond to start with, and then uh, I'll, uh, while uh, um, Mandy's talking, I'll invite people to continue to file questions. We've got quite a few fascinating ones already, um, but Mandy, over to you. Thanks very much, Tom. And thank you, Avi, for such a wonderfully interesting talk. I really, really enjoyed that. As, as Tom said, incredibly stimulating, both in terms of the visual stimuli and in terms of the intellectual stimuli you're providing us with. What I want to say and what I want to sort of think about in, 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 in the context of a response is that you know, as, I was, as I was myself reading Extraterrestrial, I was reading it with almost with two hats on. Um, Partly I was reading it as somebody who's been fascinated by space and outer space ever since I can remember. I'm the sort of geek that had cut out diagrams of the space shuttle decorating my bedroom walls when I was little. Um, but I was also reading it, as Tom says, as a historian of science. And one of the things that most fascinated me about the book was where your perspective and where your ideas about your observations sit within the incredibly rich and the incredibly varied history of scientists who've imagined encounters with extraterrestrial life. And there's a tradition, as I'm sure that you're both aware, and I'm sure most of the audience is aware as well, there's a tradition which goes back to ancient Greece, to the Pythagoreans and to the Stoics, both of which groups of philosophers envisioned a plurality of worlds, a plural, plu, I can't say the words, I can, Tom couldn't pronounce God and I can't pronounce plurality, I'll get there in the end, which is what, of course, the debate about extraterrestrial intelligence used, used, used to be referred to. So even if Aristotle's universe and Plato's universe was unique and finite, you still had plenty of people thinking about a world that, or worlds that were plural. And they're accompanied by two key themes there, the, the belief in an infinite cosmos on the one hand and the acceptance of the kind of the principle of plenitude on the other. That is what, what can exist, must exist. And those are the two key themes that support this belief in a plurality of worlds for the next few thousand years of, of, of human intellectual activity. 
Now, it becomes something of a problem for Christianity, because on the one hand, you know, an omnipotent God can create any number of different worlds if, 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 if he wants to. But on the other hand, we're told that Christ came only once, that God became incarnate in one place and in one time. And of course, Thomas Paine really goes to town on that in the Age of Reason when he basically says, you know, so hang on. So God's got millions of worlds to be concerned with, but he decides to ignore all the other worlds in favour of the one where a woman ate an apple. Really? Now, I can see Tom's horror at the theology there. But the key point here is the notion that he was taking the mickey out of, the ridiculous notion, was this notion of human uniqueness, right? We're back to Avi's wonderful point about modesty and the importance of modesty here. The idea that there are loads of worlds out there with things or people living on them is taken as read. The ridiculous thing is assuming that humans are unique. And theologists like Thomas Chalmers, they write books to refute Paine's theology. But again, in that refutation, they're not questioning the notion of extraterrestrial intelligence. Instead, they're having to fall back on the notion that, yes, indeed, humanity is the only species to have fallen from the grace of God. We are the only species that needed an incarnation because we are the only, only humanity needed to be redeemed. And that's, that's sort of 18th century. And by the time you get to the 19th century, you've got the figure, you've got the really key figure of William Hewell, um, who is the guy that um, coined the term scientist as against the term um, natural philosopher. Tom is, of course, the professor of natural philosophy at the University of York, I'm sure, which he very, a position that he very much enjoys. It's William Ewell that actually invents the term scientist in the 19th century. And he wades into this debate on the plurality of worlds. And what he's trying to do there now is to turn it into an empirical matter. You know, we've got a philosophical, we've got theoretical, we've got reasoning questions beforehand. And now what Hewell is trying to do is to, is, to, is to come up with some kind of empirical way of examining all of this. And he basically winds up taking a position against the idea of plenitude, which he bases on the empirical evidence of the very specific and the very unique history of, of the earth itself. But his position is really not popular. By the late 19th century, of course, you've got the canals on Mars and Lowell observing the canals on Mars. And by that point, belief that there's going to be life on Mars is so strong that there's a prize. There's an actual prize called the pre Guzman Prize, which is established in the early 20th century. And it's going to be awarded to the first person that can, who succeeds in communicating with another planet, but that planet can't be Mars. Mars is specifically excluded from the prize because doing that, it was thought, was just going to be so easy, that communications with Mars was going to be so easy. So despite these figures, figures like Hewell and Alfred Russell Wallace, who was, of course, the co-discovery of the theory of evolution um, with Darwin, despite the fact they're trying to push back against this on the grounds that the chain of events that produce intelligent life on Earth is so long and so complicated, the chances of it being replicated elsewhere are so vanishingly small, they don't really make a dent in the persistent assumption both at the scholarly level and, and at the, the public level, that extraterrestrial life and even extraterrestrial intelligence is more likely than not. So in the 1930s, for example, Ernest Barnes, who's a mathematician and a fellow of the Royal Society, he later becomes Bishop of Birmingham. What he said was he was, he was speaking out against a particular theory for planetary formation. He was speaking out against the collision theory for planetary formation. And he said, well, this can't be right, because if it's right, then it doesn't explain, then we can't account, then it doesn't account for extraterrestrial life. So the reason why the theory is not acceptable is because it doesn't allow for the, or it makes it harder to envision, to imagine extraterrestrial life being out there. Again, as in the early 19th century, ET, extraterrestrial life, is the given, it's the background assumption. Other theories and other experiments have to be construed in such a way as to fit with it. And Barnes is interesting because in 1931, he actually publishes an article in Nature where he says, look, guys, if you want to make contact with whoever or whatever is out there, one way of doing it is going to be via the radio. We need to start listening, he's saying in 31. And that, of course, is the idea that's then picked up 30 years later um, by Giuseppe Cocconi and Philip Morrison when they make a much, much, much more specific version of the same proposal, identifying the frequencies that you should be listening on. And it's at this point that the debate shifts. It's no longer about the plurality of worlds. It's now about extraterrestrial intelligence. And that's when things get really, really fascinating for historians, because you really now are at the point that Hewell wants to get to earlier. You can start doing empirical work, which opens up all kinds of beautiful questions like where do you look? How do you look? What are the methodologies you want to use? And what are the assumptions? What's the theory that's underlying these methodological assumptions?
So you've got that paper um, from Coney and Morrison in 1959. You've got the Frank Drake um, initial project Osma experiments in the 1960s. In 1965, it's actually thinking about how you might detect extraterrestrial life that gets James Lovelock on the path to what is to become the Gaia hypothesis. You've got people trying to figure out how, how can, you, can you build a telescope that's big enough to see the lights on the dark side of the planets. And alongside the search for rest, extraterrestrial intelligence, by the mid-1980s, you've got projects like um, CETA, the search for extraterrestrial artifacts, with people like... Um, Oh, Francisco Valdez from Kitt Peak National Observatory, setting out the different kinds of classes of extraterrestrial objects that might be found, extra, extraterrestrial artifacts that might be found, and mapping out the spaces in the solar system where it might be profitable to look for them. As the 20th century closes, you start to see this ET search starting to fade a little bit in, in popularity, particularly in the United States. But even as the US government is starting to withdraw the funding for this, scholarly societies like the Academy of, of Aeronautics, for example, they're discussing and they're agreeing protocols for what happens after you've detected artificial life. What steps do you then take? What steps should be taken by scientists and by human communities to respond to the discovery of something that is not of the earth. And then of course, by the 21st century, by, by the first decade of the 21st century, we're suddenly awash in exoplanets with a, with a Kepler te telescope and all. The European Space Agency launches the CORO mission in 2009, sorry, 2006, I beg its pardon, specifically to look for terrestrial, that is terrestrial-like rocky planets. And we've got actual scientific disciplines then focused on the study of extraterrestrial life. You've got astrobiology, you know, the study of the origins and the existence and the nature of extraterrestrial life. Um, you've got, and that becomes a degree subject, both in the United States and the United Kingdom. You've got um, space archaeology, astroarchaeology from about 2005 onwards. That also kicks off with people both studying human-made artifacts in space and working out how studying those can help us develop techniques for detecting life on other planets, de detecting evidence of, of, of past life there. And we're actually recording this um, for, for broadcast in Australia, I think, as well. And it should be noted that Australian academics, oh, sorry, Australian scholars like Alice Gorman and John Campbell have both been really, really important in the founding of, of, of that astroarchaeology discipline. Back in the UK, was it 2010? I think the, the, the Royal Society held a really brilliant meeting, which was supposed to discuss both strategies for detection, detecting extraterrestrial life, and the consequences of such a detection for both science and broader society. And one of the outcomes was this fantastic London scale for imp for evaluating the impact of such consequences is kind of like the Richter scale, but the earthquake is in your head rather than underneath your feet. And they talked about loads of other stuff as well, like you know, whether we can figure out ways of of detecting alternate micro, microbial life on Earth, um, what they were calling the shadow biosphere, which sounds wonderful, you know, as a way of, of, of refining the Drake equations, for example. And, and, look, and I could witter on forever and I should shut up now. But basically what I kept wondering as I was reading through extraterrestrial was you, where do you locate your ideas and your work in this tradition? So how do you fit into this this brilliant ecosystem? Is, but so me shutting up and you talking now. Sorry, I, I do turn. Thank you. Right. That, it's a great question. That's the history of extraterrestrials. So, Avi, now where 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 where, where does your new chapter? How does your new chapter fit into that story? Right. First of all, I wanted to to thank Mandy for uh, educating me so well on 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 the history. I mean, I, I learned a lot from your uh, discussion, and I, I I'm really grateful and. Um, you know, the way I operated is pretty much like a kid. I, I didn't really care much about the past and what people said in the past. I tried to follow the evidence because science is really based on evidence. And there were peculiar features of this object. And I just suggested what sounded to me like a plausible hypothesis, you know, in the same spirit as... Uh, when people reported about an anomaly in the early universe, I said I wrote a paper suggesting that dark matter may have, you know, electric charge, a very small electric charge, to explain that anomaly. So, in very much the same spirit, I propose here an explanation to the facts that were observed, and it was not driven by an attempt. Uh, to reproduce some notions of the past, or it was just following the evidence and trying to learn like a kid. Now, after doing that, and after getting all the backlash and the attention, 
uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm struck by the emotional response of my colleagues. And, you know, it pretty much says a lot about them, not so much about me, because I'm just the kid uh, saying that, the, you know, the emperor has no clothes. Uh, but um, it's, you know, the emperor itself uh, has to explain why they have no clothes, because I think this subject should be part of the mainstream of science, the way science is done, just like we have cosmology, the, the, uh, we're trying to understand our roots, cosmic roots, the beginning of the universe. It used to be part of theology. It appears in the first chapter of the Bible, the Old Testament, but now it's a matter of scientific discussion. Uh, you know, it used to be said that the human body has a soul and therefore uh, anatomy should be forbidden. Uh, and imagine if the scientific community would say, oh, the human body is a controversial subject. Some people say it has a soul. We don't want to discuss it. Uh, there is a taboo on it. Some people say nonsense about it. Therefore, forget it's off boundary and it shouldn't be part of the mainstream. Where would modern medicine be? I think science has an obligation to clear up the, uh, the fog uh, when we enter situ uh, topics of interest to the public. If we have the instruments and the scientific method can bring clarity to the picture. So I don't really care what people said hundreds of years ago. If we, if we now can collect the evidence, let's approach this in a brave way, uh, basically collect the evidence and figure out what's going on. You know, Open the curtains on our windows and look out and see if we have neighbors. That's a very simple thing to do rather than argue, do we have neighbors? Uh, do we not have neighbors? What are the theological implications? Who cares? Let's just check, open the window and look out if we have neighbors. So if we can look at all the interstellar uh, objects that enter the solar system, take photographs of those that approach us and every now and then see a piece of equipment that will resolve the discussion. If we, now there is the Pentagon report about to be delivered to Congress, you know, if, if these are real objects that uh, the Pentagon report is talking about, and they don't belong to other nations, this is something we can clear up. We can say, bring all the kids from the neighborhood, you know, all the nations and say, is this yours? Are you able to do this? And if they say no, then it's extraterrestrial. And then we can apply the scientific method and figure out what these objects are. So my point is rather simple. Instead of arguing and having prejudice, let's just figure it out like we do in science. You know, this should be part of the mainstream. It's a question of such great importance. How can scientists ridicule the discussion on this subject? How can they push it to the sidelines and at the same time invest hundreds of millions of dollars in the search for dark matter, invest $1.1 billion in the search for gravitational waves from the cosmos? You know, these questions have much less impact on the daily lives of people. So what I find really pathological, I would say unhealthy, is that here you have a question of great interest that the scientific community is ridiculing, pushing to the sidelines, and that's unhealthy. I think um, I'm absolutely right now. We've got some really great questions have come in from some uh, listeners. So uh, we're going to go to those uh, just in, in a minute. Well, in fact, you've already answered some because a, couple, a few of them, which I would have grouped together anyway, were asking how... What's how much effort, how much money, resources should we devote to this? Given, of course, that there are other things to do. Um, so, it, it, uh, it, and and how do we work out how valued this is? How do we tension this? The you know official officialese about this funding for SETI, SETA, um, and, and the other searches for extraterrestrial well, life I, against I, dark matter and so on, and engineering and health and vaccines. Yeah, I actually wrote a paper about that. So it should be calibrated relative to the uh, funds allocated in the search for primitive life, which is mainstream right now in the astronomy community. So you can say, let's allocate at least 10%, 20% of the funds that we allocate to search for oxygen in the atmospheres of planets. Because, you know, this is a, the other way to calibrate it is to say we invest a certain amount of money in other foundational questions, in cosmology or in science more generally, this should be a foundational question that we allocate the same amount of money. You know, we, we are searching for dark matter, we are searching in the dark, and we are not finding anything. So nobody complains about it, that it's part of the mainstream when we don't find things. So why should anyone complain and say, we need extraordinary evidence before we actually engage in a discussion? The point is, if you are not collecting uh, data, if you don't invest, let's say, a billion dollars in this question, uh, 
then you will not have the extraordinary evidence. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's mm-hmm. like stepping on the grass and saying, look, the grass doesn't grow. I, I do point out, I want to pick up one other thing that you and Mandy did have a little bit of a disagreement about if I if my ears were tuned. So I think I think behind Mandy's point was that we can always learn from history. And I'm probably misrepresenting you if, if if I if I rudely say that you're saying no, we can leave history behind and we need to do the science now. Um couple of things. One is that given that these visits might be very rare, um well, three things. One is, it, might there have been visits in the past? And I'm um, remembering my teenage years and those awful books by Eric von Daniken who, who claim to have seen archaeological evidence of, yes, no. So we can make big mistakes there, obviously. Second, however, um, is is the, is the, what, the reason that we want this to be true. I mean, the reason that it somehow means a lot to be human. I mean, NASA seems to defend most of its planetary missions on the basis that we might find life. I might think Mars is fascinating, whether or not there's life there. Europa, amazing. Let's go there anyway. But the documentation, the public hook is always about finding life. There's something deeply human about there being a need for others. And surely... I mean, Mandy, both of you, we can learn from history about why that's true. I mean, that tells us about ourselves, doesn't it? It tells us a lot about how we manage what we perceive to be the boundary between human and not human. Um, in, in that sense. Um, and there's a whole, I mean, one of, I didn't want really to get, I mean, I, I, I realised from Avi's book that he's not very keen on science fiction, which is why I didn't, I didn't wander into any of those areas. I do think that you, I will say that I think you're a little bit unfair to the very, very good science fiction that is out there, but that's all I'll say on that, that matter. <laughs> envisioning, envisioning what's, if it, one of the things that people talk a lot about these days is thinking about multi-species humanity and trying to, when I'm not working on the history of the future, I'm usually working on the history of prehistory. So it's the, it's looking at the, 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 the history of attempts to study the, the pre-human past. And people talk a lot about and try to think about the notion of multi-species humanity and how a multi uh, the, how the conception of a multi-species humanity might work in the context of the, of, of the Anthropocene. Right. And what I find particularly fascinating about that is the way in which the notion, it turns on the notion of what we define as people and who gets to be called a person. And in some contexts, I mean, I'm not sure if any of the house animals are around at the minute, but cats and dogs are often treated, particularly by very rich Westerners, as if they are people, that they become less that they are they're no longer alien they're invited actually into our homes to share to, to, to share domestic spaces with us whereas at the same time we can define actual human beings as 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 non-people but can I can I park that just for a minute because one of the points that I was wondering about was and obviously I don't know the kind of pressures that you've been put under in the aftermath of the publication of extraterrestrial and I'm sure that you know and I don't want to imagine the kind of problems that you've had to face um and i you know i'd study scientific controversies as well and understand how um very plight and heated and very non-plight and heated they can get but i suppose what i was trying to get at here was that there from my perspective at least there's a there's a broad community of people out there scientists out there who are investigating the 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 issues that that you're that you're focused on that who are trying to use trying to do exactly what you were talking about um in 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 your very vivid talk which is to examine space artifacts to figure out how we how we can use those to figure out what is not a human artifact in that sense. And so I was wondering what, I mean, the difficulty of doing interdisciplinary work is always trying to build those boundaries and build those communities across the academic silos. So I was wondering what kind of opportunities or what kind of prospects you saw for building that kind of cross-disciplinary coalition that is exactly, you know, you're absolutely right. We need to open the windows. We need to look out. We need to look up. God help us if we leave it to the to to Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk is in that sense. But what do you see uh, what 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 do you, what's your assessment of the prospects of building that kind of science, that that kind of cross disciplinary consensus? Yeah, so I think the real issue, the, the real the thing that is missing is this becoming a mainstream activity. I mean, there are people thinking about it. There were people suggesting it, but um, a mainstream activity means funding at the level of a billion dollars, having students, uh, having postdocs, 
having a lot of senior people engaged in this, hundreds of them, thousands of them, within the astronomy community. That's a mainstream activity. If you have one or two people tweeting about it, that's not a mainstream activity. That's a, at the sidelines. And if the rest of the community is ridiculing any discussion on this, we are not in a healthy situation on this question because the public cares about it. Now, the, the other thing is people feel very comfortable talking about microbes, both because microbes formed on Earth as soon as the Earth cooled, so it's much easier to imagine that they would exist in many places. But more importantly, it's not a threat to our ego. So if there are microbes on Mars, you know, we can still feel pretty much, you know, these are just like pets at our home. We are superior to them. There is no threat to our ego. Um, what I think is different, uh, I, don't, I don't imagine uh, biological creatures visiting us because the trip takes so long. I imagine equipment. And uh, I can imagine a civilization that, uh, had, let's say, a thousand years of technological development beyond us, and it, uh, the technology would look like magic. And just think about robots uh, or with artificial intelligence operating at a level that, you know, is it, difficult for us to comprehend because we are rather primitive. Uh, you know, we would be able to understand it maybe if we reach the same technological level. And, you know, it's not pets. It's someone at your home that is much more intelligent than you are. And it's a, a piece of equipment. It's not biological. Yeah, yeah. So just think about that. Yeah, it's also the, this is one of the reasons, incidentally, why um, science fiction is interesting here, is because from the very, very early days of writing science fiction, that point that you've made has been absolutely at the heart of the fear of the alien. Essentially, that aliens will be able to do to, to forgive me, but we will be able to do to rich white Westerners what rich white Westerners have done to the rest of the planet. And that's even it's it's explicit in H.G. Wells, and it runs all the way through the rest of it. This is why you know so much science fiction is not actually about the alien; it's about understanding what it means to be human. Right. I'm, I'm we gonna. Not, yeah, we were I'm, not I'm, careful. You know, uh, Tom, just one comment yeah, about sure, what you said. You know, when you go in the wilderness, you better be quiet and not speak out because you never know whether there are predators out there. We were not quiet. We tr transmitted radio waves for more than a century, and you know if. Uh, those spread out to 100 light years. If there is a civilization within 100 light years, they may come and visit us. And because they know about us, if they have radio telescopes, and mm -hmm. the question is how quickly will they get here? And uh, if they use just chemical rockets, it will take them a million years. But if they use something faster, they can get, they may be already here. Yeah, it's a profoundly Darwinian perspective. Um, and the three body, pro All right, I'm shouting up Tom. Let's take a few, let's take a few questions from, from the uh, participants here. Um, one of the things that amused me most about this evening was reminded by Amanda that the, it, the um, competition to, uh, to, to look for alien life uh, with a reward excluded Mars because it's so easy. Um, and Stephen Peters asked, uh, love, we'd love to hear what you think, uh, Abby, about the possibility of finding some form of, of, of life on Mars. Right. Well, you know, Mars basically is a tenth of the mass of the Earth and it lost its atmosphere. That's why it doesn't have liquid water on the surface. Mm -hmm. But it did have an atmosphere and liquid water, most likely, early on. And, and so we could find, it wouldn't be surprising. The interesting question is whether life there is the same as life here. You know, whether it shares the same uh, helicity, the same genetic uh, composition and so forth. Because if not, then it shows that there are multiple paths to life, you know, not necessarily the one we find here. And um, the other thing we can do on Mars and also on the moon is search for equipment that crashed on the surface because it was not mixed with the interior. There is no atmosphere that will burn it up. So we can use it as a museum. Okay, Martian uh, astroarchaeology. Um, now, there are a couple of little techie things, but uh, techie is good. I'm understanding some of these accelerations and orbits is absolutely essential to this great question from benjamin mckenzie who's who, who points out that you you said that this anomalous trajectory um of umumua um uh, it, we were able to establish it was anomalous but but we only noticed it after it had passed the sun so he said well how do we know it was anomalous if we weren't able to to observe its trajectory around the sun Right, because, well, basically, when we observed it, we could track its position on the sky and its uh, velocity, the, the rate by which the position changed. And uh, from that, we calculate w which forces are acting on it. And uh, 
we know the force of gravity that the sun exerts and then you subtract that off and then you find that there is an extra force and that extra force is declining inversely with distance squared from the sun and it's declining in a smooth fashion. If it was due to cometary evaporation, you would get some jitter because these are coming from jets usually on the surface of the comet. And as it tumbles, the, there are variations in the spin rate of the comet and also in the push that it gets. And they, they were not noticed. Also, when a comet uh, recedes away from the sun, eventually uh, water does not sublimate anymore. It doesn't evaporate at a certain distance, and there was no cutoff in the push beyond that distance on Oumuamua. That's great, thank you. And there are a couple of questions about the light sails. Um, so one is a kind of Drake equation expectation, is if Oumuamua was typical of interstellar, suppose it was a light sail, how many light sails are about? When do we see the next one, how often they are? Um, and there's a, 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 a deeper question from Brita who asks, um, wouldn't how would it work in practice? Wouldn't wouldn't it just crash into interstellar objects on its way going this no, speed? No, so the, the chance for that is very small for the latter question. But mm -hmm. um, in terms of the number of objects, the way to estimate it is you need to assume something about the velocity distribution of those objects. If they move in random directions with equal probability, you need there should be a quadrillion of them right now in the solar system. And you know, every few years we'll see one of them getting within the orbit of the Earth around the Sun which is roughly the size, we're talking about an object the size of a football field. Of course, you could have many more that are smaller or very f um, or fewer that are bigger, uh, but that's roughly the, the order of magnitude. And, uh, you know, it's it's very different from the Drake equation uh, because in the Drake equation deals with uh, mm -hmm. detecting radio signals. Here we're dealing with physical objects. It's just like asking what's your chance if you're on a ship What's your chance to bump into a plastic bottle on the surface of the ocean? It just depends on the number of plastic bottles per unit area on the surface of the ocean. So it's they keep accumulating those plastic bottles over time, and we don't know how long they kept accumulating you know, over space, but the answer is completely different from the Drake equation. Thanks. And um, this is a question for, uh, for both of you, I think. Um, which is looking at the, well, t two questions, which look at the whole um, uh, human alien aspect from the, clever or the clever, from the other end of the telescope, as it were, from their point of view. Um, uh, uh, Steve asks, um, do, do you fear for any other world that we may eventually explore and inhabit after the mess we've made of this one? Um, and why would um, an alien constructor of an Umumura type massive spaceship be interested in visiting us as well. What, what's in it for them? No, I mean, I would think that it's just space trash, that it's not intended to spy on us. As I said before, I don't think uh, we are sufficiently interesting. Uh, most of the objects we will find are billions of years old and they just travel through space. They were, And so it could be a piece of a bigger object. It could be, uh, you know, the surface layer of a spacecraft or whatever. But I, I don't assign special significance to the fact that it came close to Earth. Um, because I, as I said before, I don't think we were interesting. If you go back, you know, when this object entered the solar system, it was 10,000 years ago. We were not that interesting back then. I think that as well, one of the more interesting thought experiments to play around with is, well, I mean, if you pose it the existence of aliens actually coming to Earth, why why would they want to talk to the humans? I mean, what makes us think that we'd actually be the interesting species? What's, what about the ants? What about the earthworms? Again, sorry to do the science fiction thing, but one of the best Star Trek films ever is The Voyage Home, where what the alien probe is interested in is the whales. So I think it's uh, there's no reason to assume the aliens would want to talk to us. And as we well know from Douglas Adams, humans are the third most intelligent species on the planet Earth in any case. By the way, intelligence is not a guarantee for uh, longevity. You know, if you think about Darwinian uh, selection, mm -hmm. Crocodiles on other planets may live for much longer than humans simply because they don't yeah. destroy the planet. You know, yeah. I, I'd love to. Um, I'd, I'd like to put something to you on this question of uh, this word arrogance has been used a few times this evening, and I didn't expect it, and that interests me. Um, and uh, I think Avi was the first to use it in in the assumption. Can, can you attached it to the assumption that we're unique? 
or somehow special. Um, and that's all because actually, of course, just to, I, I, because I'm a half historian now, at least, no, I would never call myself a big, because I have colleagues like Mandy who've taught me proper things about history, I know that the history of science has been riddled with uh, uh, falsehoods and and, and um, false facts and, and alternative histories and stuff. Um, one of which is by the, is, is, is that the, the um, uh, of course, the, the geocentric universe um, was in any, any sense arrogant. We have the idea that the Copernican revolution um, somehow displaced us from our arrogant central point. Not indeed. You know, the earth was central in medieval and Aristotle science in the same way that that um, uh, you know that the, the the detritus at the bottom of the sea is sort of central. It was the place where all the yuck went. Um, you could argue that Copernicus did the reverse and, and promoted us to the heavens. But anyway, arrogance about our position. Isn't there also a certain arrogance if, of knowledge that claims to do these sort of calculations that say that start well half or the half of the stars we know in the universe have have earth like planets therefore therefore there must be millions of of civilizations but that assumes knowledge we simply don't have and the number that i think in the drake equation that the, all, the, all these numbers that we really don't know we absolutely don't know is given there's an earth like planet in the habitable zone even given there's water what's the probability that something like life gets going? And we have no idea what that number is, really no idea. And if it's less than 10 to the minus 22, which is the number of the stars in the observable universe, then we are alone, not because we're arrogant, but because we just, it just that's what it is. Yeah, but m my sense of modesty is behaving like a kid, basically trying to learn about the world without uh, assumptions, without uh, no thinking that you know the answer in advance and it includes what you said but i would be guided by evidence and i would say let's find out let's search just like kids you know we put skin in the game we we make some uh, conjectures but but then we we test whether they're true or false based on evidence rather than say we know the answer in advance and I do think that um, in academia in particular, forget about human history, but I can tell you wh when I, you know, being in academia, that uh, arrogance is very common. And the reason for that is because much of the culture in academia is driven by the ego, trying to demonstrate that you are smart, you are wise, you are superior to relative to others. And that's the wrong motivation in science because very often we are proven wrong, you know, and Einstein was wrong on three counts when at, at, at the last decade of his career, he argued that black holes do not exist, gravitational waves do not exist, quantum mechanics doesn't have quant, uh, uh, spooky action at a distance. All, all three notions were proven wrong by later experiments. So I think there is no escape from admitting that when you work at the frontiers, you sometimes make mistakes. And the Absolutely. best way to proceed to gain knowledge is through evidence. And that, to me, is the sense of modesty. It's not so much knowing the answer in advance, saying there are so many planets out there that there must be life. It's the idea that we should search for it. Precious, lovely. Mandy? That's, that's one of the things that I really liked. One of the, I'm trying to remember it now in more detail, but the, one of the things I really liked about that Royal Society meeting um, in whenever it was, 2011, um, was, again, the way in which they brought together an interdisciplinary panel to, to think about the notion of extraterrestrial intelligence, what it would look like, how to find it, and the impact it would have on, on, on Earth. And one of the things, and I'm not sure if I'm going to get this right, so please don't quote me on it and don't think that I'm, you know, I apologise for misrepresenting people's ideas in advance. But that was the whole point of the shadow biosphere idea, wasn't it? It was basically to figure out if you could, if you could find an alternative microbial life on Earth, then that would, and then that would tell, that would say something about whether or not, the, whether or not we, as in, earthly life is it is unique and one of the 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 fascinating things about that, and this is what I'm, I mean, I'm always fascinated by methodologies i'm fascinated by scientific methodologies the way in which people were trying to imagine very creatively and very very kind of passionately also to imagine different strategies for finding the kind of evidence that you're talking about i think and sort of good so what how do we reconceptualize the way in which we think about doing these investigations and where we look and how we look and what we see so that we could recognize alternate microbial life when we saw it kind of thing and i think that's another aspect sorry go on yeah i'm just going to add something to that question from from um from uh one of from one of the chats uh, who asks what about 
if life isn't even in any form that we'd recognize at all, could there be a, um, a physical form? They talk about higher vibrations, energy. I mean, I wonder, you know, with galactic magnetic fields can be very, very complex. Might some other intelligent or computing or life form, um, causal life form, be the size of a galactic arm? Yeah, well, Diamond Dwayne's done some fantastic science fiction on that. Sorry, sorry, Avi, I interrupted you. Go for it. Avi, go for it. No, I would say that, uh, of course, things can be well beyond our imagination. Nature has more imagination than we do. But, you know, we <laughs> we should search for things that we understand, not for things that we don't understand. Yeah, yeah. And that the universe can can enrich our imagination, uh, meet us halfway and tell us where we don't. Um, the clock tells me that that we've been relativistically beaten i think we've had some time contraction while we've been talking um uh, and and so the night is drawing uh, to an end so it's it's time now to apologize to those people we've not done badly with the questions i'm sorry if you have not had yours your, your yours answered but we're all here to, to email keep the discussion going um a huge thank you to uh, avi for zooming in from Boston, I imagine you have, um, uh, from, 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 from Harvard, and for being our stimulating extra, why well, I say extraterrestrial uh, um, th this evening. Uh, that was absolutely wonderful. And uh, the wisdom on scientific humility, imagination, um, hear, hear to that. Um, Mandy, thank you so much for joining us from Aberystwyth, the equally alien planet, where I know you have zoomed in from. Uh, uh, and uh, and the, your interdisciplinary vision for this, I think we were all nodding at that. Um, and so I think that that might uh, might actually link us to our, my next thank yous, which is to our sponsors, which is the John Templeton Foundation. And one thing for mentioning those, as well as, um, as thanking them for sponsoring this event and the others in this Science Imagination, the Big Question series, is I know that they've also uh, put their weight behind a number of interdisciplinary um, ventures in this area. I know the Harvard Black Hole uh, Initiative, as I mentioned, is partly funded by JTF. And in fact, very sweetly, um, uh, a, a philosophy student I help to supervise at York and I, we drop in and uh, to their, their seminars are very, very generous and reaching out. So they have philosophers and historians as well as physicists and cosmologists there. And maybe that's the way uh, to go ahead. I, I'm the founding director of that center, by the way. I should uh, said that that's right so um, and I, the, my visit to you was just oh, one lot of us are very dear to my heart that's well next can best. you come next year abby can you come next year and tell us all about black holes i think that's what we that's what we'd love please we need to do we need to do black holes don't we everyone um uh, the recording of this event will be available on the festival youtube so tell everyone about it you can watch it again uh, for those of you down under as i think has already been mentioned it has been recorded for an abc podcast um and so uh well, I'm, as I speak, uh, thank you to those in Australia who are listening uh, to us and thank you to, to ABC. If anyone would like a copy of either of Avi's book, Extraterrestrial, Extraterrestrial, or Mandy's book, Human with Charlotte, or any other book for that matter connected with the, um, the festival, get in touch with foxlanebooks.uk.uk slash festival of ideas, our very own local uh, festival bookseller and they will help you out and uh, finally we very much hope that you'll continue to engage with the rest of the whole of the festival all the details of which are on the website all events are free and and online um, and uh, uh, please uh, uh, check it out book in come along uh, particularly to the next events in this series on science imagination and the big uh, questions. Mandy will be joining me with Francesca Colt on Tuesday to discuss narratives of conflict in science, but our very next event on Monday lunchtime is Science Imagination and Poetry, which is going to blow your mind, I promise, and features uh, a visit again from Anna Phoebe, who launched our festival so wonderfully with that haunting violin music and poetry from York Minster. Uh, but so with that, um, it uh, uh, this lead me to thank the most important people here, which is not us, but you who came and listened and joined in the discussion. Thank you so much. And I wish you a rest of the pleasant afternoon if you're in Boston or Aberystwyth. Uh, you're probably just about that far, aren't you, West? Uh, or evening if you're in York. Good night from us all.